وصلوات الله وسلامه على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى اله الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين الحمد لله على نعمه الاسلام وكفى بها نعمه الله سبحانه وتعالى as was mentioned earlier for a wisdom has brought a lot of muslims to the west and the topic that i was given was to talk about the role of muslims in the west and I want to just take a little historical discursion and make it as quick as possible because I've given a limited amount of time to talk about a subject that uh, is rather extensive. If we look at the history of the West, the West has two dominant, two dominant influences. And before it was called the Judeo-Christian culture, which is actually uh, a name that was given not that long ago, it was called the Greco-Roman culture. And it's important to understand a people, you have to understand where they came from, what the backgrounds of those people are, what their philosophies are, and these type of things. So it's important in understanding the Western people is to understand where they came from. The Greco-Roman civilization are two distinct civilizations, the Greek and the Roman. And I don't want to go into the Greek, but I have more emphasis a little bit on the Roman. And it's interesting that in the Arabic language, the word Arom, which is used in Surah Arom, is a word that generally has been given the meaning of the Europeans. When the Arabs say Aromi, they mean a European, somebody from Europe. Does not specifically mean the Greeks, nor does it specifically mean the Italians, who were uh, called uh, Romans based on their capital being in the city of Rome. They're a very fascinating people, the Romans. They had a distinct quality in that they were a rather tolerant colonizer. And tyrants can, be, tyrants can be tolerant. They're not always uh, butchers, they're not always slaughterers. But the Romans would go and they would colonize people and what they would do, instead of opposing those people, instead of, uh, instead of subduing and subjugating them in a humiliating way, they would often honor their religion, honor their gods. This is something they did to the Jews, unlike the Greeks, who were traditionally known to be rather uh, what's termed now, quote unquote, anti-Semitic. The Romans, on the contrary, actually honored many of the Jewish people. They gave them titles. They would allow them to become Roman citizens. This created a faction within the Jewish people themselves. There were Jewish people that were very anti-Roman, and there were other Jewish uh, groups within the communities that were pro-Roman. And you can see this uh, debate and these tensions being worked out in the gospel narrations that exist to this day. And this was something that was happening at that time and continued to happen for uh, quite some time until the Romans eventually adopted or rather redacted the religion of the Nazarenes of the Nasara according to the Quran which is Christianity but again they redacted it and changed it. This change took place based on the fact that the Christians who were dispersed from uh, Judea, from Galilee and these areas and literally spread out in what was then known as the Roman Empire and they lived amongst the Romans and for three centuries there was a lot, a great deal of persecution. And despite the fact that they were persecuted, they maintained their religion, which was very impressive because of the fact that they were being persecuted, they maintained their religion. After a very short period of time though, there begins to be a, a change and the change has very specific sociological and historical reasons. The Romans began to adopt the religion of the Christians. There were massive alterations that were done, but th this is something beside the fact. The fact is that they began to adopt a religion of a Semitic people, because the first Christians were Semitic, a religion of a Semitic people that was completely alien to them, and they not only did they uh, not previously adopt that religion with rare exception, but they looked down on those people as being inferior to them. The Romans were an extremely arrogant people. They considered these people inferior to them. So it's a fascinating historical uh, fact that these people who saw a people as less than them began to adopt their religion. The dominant reason that's given is the deep social discordance that existed in the Roman Empire at that time. These people had literally gone from uh, their, their civilization to a state of gross barbarity. They were having orgies. Their sexual promiscuity was uh, beyond belief. They were um, literally killing people. They were watching people die as a sport as an actual uh, an enjoyment. And I would liken this to the violent films and these things, well, although it is fantasy up to a point, 
nonetheless, these people have actually come to enjoy watching very grossly violent films. This is a modern phenomenon, but it has its it, it has its its uh, it has its precedent in this Roman sickness of enjoying watching blood sport. So this is something that the modern Romans have again started to do. They enjoy seeing the spilling of blood and they actually get excited through this. They also enjoy watching orgies. They enjoy watching pornography in last year became a greater money winner than what they call dominant media, which from an Islamic point of view is still pornographic. The quote-unquote dominant media, which has now been overstripped by the pornographic industry. They're both, from an Islamic perspective, pornographic, but what they would term hardcore pornography is now making more money for the media industry than their, uh, what they call, family entertainment. This is very significant for the Muslims. These people have entered into a state of decay, a social decay, an ethical, spiritual, and moral decay that is unprecedented in recent history, but yet we can see its analogies in the Roman period. And this is the point at which Christianity became to be adopted because it was literally a, 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 a movement that called to a deep spirituality. The Christians, despite the fact that their aqidah, as we would look at it today, their creed, their, their, their kerygma, was, was uh, grossly distorted, nonetheless, they had a very high ethical standard and they had a social morality that was deeply impressive to people that were recognizing that their societies were in crisis. And this is important for the Muslims to remember this, because already there, was, there is happening within these cultures movements to, to counter-oppose this massive disintegration of their societies because they recognize and they know that the, literally the cries of the, their death cries are taking place now. They know that if they continue on the path that they are on, that their societies will completely disintegrate within a very short period and we are witnessing this in our lifetime. So where does this place the Muslims? The Muslims, unfortunately, are uh, an oh man, I don't want to go into the, the um, constant, we have this constant, it's almost a sadistic um, tendency to repeat how pathetic we've become, the pathetic conditions, despite the fact that our situation is unbelievable and it's unprecedented historically, nonetheless, the Muslim peoples, as a peoples, are the only peoples that still have certain things intact within their societies. The Muslim family is the only family with the exception of very small aboriginal communities and rural communities in different countries, the Muslim family is the only family that is maintaining a semblance of integrity in the entire world. Not simply the uh, Western Hemisphere, but in the rest of the world. The family is disintegrating before our eyes. And the family is the essence of any social society. No society can endure without the essential element of family being maintained, the integrity of the family maintained. And this is why the Sharia of Islam, the foundational element of Sharia is the preservation of the family, to preserve the family, to allow for a, 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 a fitra nature, not only to be uh, nurtured within the family, but to be preserved for the next generation. This is what the Prophet ﷺ recited after he gave this hadith that every child is born on fitrah and we should never forget this. This includes the children of the English, the children of the French, the children of the Americans, every kullu mawludin wulid ala fitrah The fitrah is this, is the inherent internal nature of the human being which is to be in a natural inclination towards submission and towards the recognition of a cause behind every event and the ultimate cause behind the event of creation is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed it into existence. Every child recognizes that there is a reason and this is why the dominant question of children is why? Why is this so? Why is this that? Why is it this color? Why did that happen? A child wants to know why and the ultimate why is why are we here? Why are we here? Why have we been placed on the earth? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us Reasons in the Quran. The first and primary reason, ma kharaktu jinna wa insa illa liyabudun. Allah had only created the jinn, the, the sprite world, and the human world except to worship Allah. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said to know Allah for knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa taala. 
The second purpose, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, huwa alladhi khalaq al-mawt wa al-hayata liyabluwakum, ayyukum ahsanu amala. He is the one who created you in order to test you. Liyabluwakum, a lamb here is what they call ta'lil, is to indicate that this is a purpose for our creation, is to test and to try us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that He tries us with bisharri wa bil khayr, with good and with evil, with evil and with good. We are tested in both ways, fitna. As a fitna, both ways are tested. So the human being is tested with affliction of both good and both evil. And we need to understand this as Muslims. Our adab, according to the Prophet ﷺ, he said, جُعِلَ adab ummati fi dunyaha." The adab of our ummah is in this world. So we should not be constantly um, uh, horrified at the condition of the Muslim. This is a reflection of our own internal states. Allah is purifying this ummah. In reality, The tribulations of the Muslims are a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that our purification in this, is in this world and not in the next world. Alhamdulillah. Because the adab of dunya khalidun fiha abada. The people of the next world, they will be eternally in a punishment. So the punishment of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years is nothing in comparison to this. And this is clear in Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, the great Imam of Egypt, when he was on his horse and one Jewish man stopped him and he said, Ya Imam, هَلْ أَنْتُمَ الَّذِينَ تَقُولُونَ أَنَّ نَبِيُّكُمْ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَمُ قَالَ الدُّنْيَا سِجِنَ الْمُؤْمَنُ وَجَنَّةُ الْكَافِرُ And this Jewish man was a, 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 a zayyat, he was an oil keeper and his robe was messed up and he was a poor man. And Ibn Hajjah said, we say that our Prophet ﷺ said, the dunya is the prison of the mu'min and the jannah, the paradise of the kafir. And the Jewish man looked at this imam in his beautiful robes on his horse with the izzah of the Muslims. This man had the izzah of the Muslims and the Jewish man said, what type of prison are you in and what type of paradise am I in? Ibn Hajar with the ilham of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he loved his head and then he raised it, looked to the sky and then looked at this man and he said, Wallahi, lamma ata'amru ma a'adda Allahu li, li islami wa ihsani min na'im, innini la ara annani fi sijin fi hadihi dunya, wa lamma atafakiru fi ma a'adda raka min al-adab li kuhrika wa bu'dika an illahi subhanahu wa ta'ala wa inkarika li rasulihi, inna kalaf al-jannah fi hadihi dunya. He said, when I think about the thing that Allah has promised me in the Akhirah and I compare it to what I'm in in this world, I can only come to the conclusion that this world is a prison. And when I think of the punishment that Allah has prepared for you in the next world because of your rejection of Allah and His Messenger and your obstinate, I can only come to the conclusion that you are in paradise now compared to what awaits you. This is the understanding of the Muslims, the relative reality of existence, that things are relative and we have to have the big perspective. This is the gift of Islam, this is the gift of the one that recites the Quran and reflects on its meaning, is recognizing these things. And so we have to understand the relative state of our condition. The tribulation that the Muslims are in, إِذَا اللَّهُ أَرَادَ لِي عَبْدًا خَيْرًا عَجَّلَ لَهُ عُقُوبَةَ ذَنْبِهِ فِي دُنْيَاهُ this is a hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu said, if, a, if Allah wants good for his slave, then he will punish him for his wrong action in this world and not in the next world. So we should see all of this as purification when the Quran sends down the great message of uh, when we were afflicted with a musibah. When an affliction, a calamity afflicted you, and you had already afflicted them with the likes of it, and twice, you said, where is this affliction coming from? The Prophet is commanded to say to all of us, every single moment until the end of time, this affliction is from your own self. And so we have to recognize who we are, and why we're in the condition we're in, and we should say, Alhamdulillah wa shukrillah ala kulli hal. Alhamdulillah wa shukrillah ala kulli hal. This blessing of Islam is a ni'mah. Now where is this in relation to all of where we are in the Muslim world? In the, in the West, we have a, a, a position here. We are literally ambassadors of, of, of Islam. And we have, we have uh, betrayed the trust that the Prophet ﷺ gave to us. We have betrayed this trust. When you see the Muslims, the Yemenis who, who traveled all over the world building dhikr stores, literally dhikr stores everywhere and inviting people to drink from the fresh drink of Tawheed. And these now we see the, the, in, in my city where I live, 80% of the liquor stores are owned by Arab Muslims. 80% of the liquor stores and they are in black communities amongst the poor and the oppressed. And these are the same people. 
These are the grandchildren of those people that spread the light of Islam. So we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing here? When a, a brother, an African-American imam in the city of East Palo Alto that has the highest murder rate in the United States per capita, when he wanted to make a, because of alcohol is the number one cause of murder in the United States, Umm al khabaid when he wanted to make protests against the liquor stores, there were Muslims in that mosque that opposed him because their friends that they ate with owned those liquor stores. This is the state, you see. Now we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? We have to ask ourselves this question. And I don't have time to explain it. So uh, I'm just going to quickly say just a few things then. The first thing is that we should get out of this state of ghurur. We should get out of this state of delusion. Ghurur. Don't be deluded by the deluder. The Muslims, we are the closest ummah to Bani Israel. The danger of the, the, this statement that the Prophet ﷺ gave us is what is the disease of Bani Israel that we are Sha'bullah and Muqtab. We are the chosen people. Chosen simply because we were born into a state of ethnicity that is not shared by the rest of humanity. The Muslims should not be deluded into thinking that Islam is some kind of birthright that you're born into and simply because your name is Abdurrahman or Khadija or whatever that this makes you a Muslim. We should get out of this deception. When Umar ibn al-Khattab sent Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas to Qadisiyah, and this is one of the determining battles of the Muslims, when he sent him, he told him, Ya Sa'ad, Ya Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, La yughurrannaka an yuqal khalu rasulillahi, fa inna allaha la yamhu sayyab al-sayya, wa lakinahu yamhu sayyab al-hasan, wa laysa bayna allahi wa bayna ahad al-nasabun illa bi ta'atihi. He said, O Sa'ad, Ibn Abi Waqqas, don't be deluded in that people say that you're the uncle, the maternal uncle of the Messenger of Allah. Don't be deluded by this. And do, we should not be deluded the fact that we are Muslims or that our grandfather was a scholar from Kashmir or from wherever. I hear this so much from Muslims, oh my grandfather was a scholar. Don't tell me about your grandfather. What are you? Who are you? What are you and where are you and what are you doing? This is what we should ask ourselves, who we are. We have talked about the glory of the past. Let's forget the glory of the past. The glory of the past is delusion for us because it's the earnings of those who went before us. It's not our earnings. We don't eat from their plates. We eat from the plates that we make, from the food that we prepare. In this world, we will eat in the next world either sweet fruit of Iman or the bitter fruit of Nifaq. But it's our choice. And then he said that there's no nasab, there's no relationship between a slave and between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this way. And Allah does not wipe out a bad deed with another bad deed, but he wipes out a bad deed with a good deed. I warn you that you should be a shadda ihtirasin minkum min aduikum, that you should be more concerned about your own condition than the condition of your enemies. Subhanallah. Reflect on this meaning. You should be more concerned about your own condition than the conditions of your enemies. The disease of the munafiqun, yahsibuna or yahsibuna kulla sayhatan alayhim. They think that every little thing is against them. No. Think about who you are. Think about what you are. Think about what you have to offer. Don't think about what's being done out there. All of that is either tribulation from Allah or a blessing. There's nothing else. If harm comes to us, it's a tribulation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's how we should see it. So this is what Umar radiallahu is saying to this man. Don't be concerned so much about your enemy. Be concerned about your own state. فَإِنَّ ذَنُوبَ الْجَيْشِ أَخْوَفُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ عَدُوِّهِمْ Because the wrong actions of this army of the Muslims is more dangerous than the, the, the power of the armies that they're fighting of their enemies. وَإِنَّمَا يُنْصَرَ الْمُسْلِمُونَ and the Muslims are given victory based on the disobedience of their enemies. This is where the secret of the victory of the Muslims is on the disobedience of the enemies that they're fighting in their distance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because our numbers are not like their numbers. They outnumber us. They have always outnumbered us. Our numbers are not like their numbers. And our udda, our strength and power, is not like their strength and power. This is this is Umar ibn al-Khattab, al-Faruq. The one that the Prophet said about him, if there was a Prophet after me, it would have been Umar. 
فإن استوينا في المعصية فإن لهم الفضل علينا if we become equal in disobedience to Allah then they have the fadl they have the preference over us في القوة in strength وإن وإن لا ننصر عليهم بفضلنا لم نغلبهم بقوتنا if we are not given victory over them by our preference by our spiritual ethical moral superiority then we will never defeat them with military strength and power ولا تقول إن عدونا شر منا فلن يصلت علينا فرب قوم صلت من هو شر منه كما صلت على البني إسرائيل لما عملوا بمعاصي لا كفار المجوز فجاسوا خلال الديار وكان وعدا مفعولا and don't say that your enemy is worse than you and therefore they could never become over us this is at a time when the Muslims knew nothing of victory they all they knew was victory they didn't know defeat and now we know the truth of Omar's statement don't say that because they're worse than you they'll never have strength and power and overcome you because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give strength and power to those who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala يَعْبُدُونِي لَا يُشْرِكُونَ بِيَا شَيْئًا This is the state and condition that is a necessity for tamkeen in the earth. When we saw in Afghanistan, شُرُوطَ النَّصَرْ تَوَفَّرَتْ They had the conditions of victory over their enemy. But شُرُوطَ التَّمْكِينَ is not the same as شُرُوطَ النَّصَرْ The conditions of being established in the earth is not the same as the conditions of victory over the kuffar. And those conditions did not exist. And this is the, the, the theme that has been taken This is the sickness that we have Wallahi is not ikhtilaf The sickness that we have is that we do not know the adab of ikhtilaf We don't know the adab of ikhtilaf We have lost the courtesies of disagreeing Wallahi there was a time in this ummah When Abu Hanifa radiallahu anhu would sit with atheists With mulhideen And he would dialogue with them in the presence of Muslims with waqar and sakina and he would convince them of the truth of Islam. The Muslims were never afraid to debate the non-Muslims and yet now to, today we're unable to simply sit at a table together and speak with the adab and the courtesy of silence, of letting somebody finish what they have to say before we cut them off, of, of just showing off and impressing each other with things that we've memorized and these type of things. Imam Malik, he used to say, لَيْسَ الْعِلْمْ كَثْرَةَ الْرِوَايَاتِ وَإِنَّمَ الْعِلْمْ نُورٌ جَعَلَهُ اللَّهُ فِي قَلْبِ الْمُؤْمَنِ Knowledge is not having lots of narrations and lots of memorizations. Knowledge is a light that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts in the heart of the mu'min. And this is the light that needs to be replaced. This is the light that needs to be recharged. And this is the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this light is the light of wahi. And when we return to the wahi of Allah or we, we move forward with the wahi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will be given victory. We will see people entering into the deen in these countries of waja. When we clean up our neighborhoods, Wallahi, in this country, where are the, where are the dirtiest areas? I, I just ask you that. Go into the mosque, look at our mosque, look at how we treat the Quran, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to change ourselves. We need to elevate ourselves. And the most important elevation of the self is the elevation of our, our intellects. This is the light that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. Nurun ala nur, wahyun ala al-aqal. This is the light that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us that He ennobled Bani Adam. Laqad karramna Bani Adam. The Bani Adam was ennobled with the intellect, but when it's imbued with the light of wahi, then you see transformations, you see miracles, you see changes, you see progression, you see moving forward to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you see people being raised up in Karajat. The community in England, we must build institutions here. We must get our children into schools. This is the most important thing at this point. You must get your children out of these state schools and into schools where they can be raised and nurtured. If, you, if they have a problem with saying Islamic school, just we don't have to have Islamic on there. But one of the things of they say that uh, everyone claims to have arrived to Layla and Layla doesn't uh, let them, uh, that doesn't let their claims uh, be confirmed. You see, we all say madrasa islamiya. Let's get rid of the islamiya and just make a madrasa and make it Islamic. So we don't have to put an appellate or a name there. It has the reality of Islam like Hassan al-Basri, kan al-Islamu, isman, kan al kan al kan al tasawwuf ismu haqiqa bila ism wa alan asbaha ism bila haqiqa that the in the time of the companions the idea of purification of the self was a name was a reality without a name and now it's become a name without a reality 
So let us get rid of all these claims and simply do the job at hand. Get out there into the ditches, get into the trenches. We have a serious problem. The youth in this country are completely disenfranchised. They feel alienated from the Muslims. They feel, and this is right for a pedagog for demagogic uh, type of movements, for people coming up and stirring up the rabble and getting people joining fanatical fringe groups, people that have no fit in deen. If you see people talking about Islam, you say, Hatu Burhanakum, bring, let me see, where did you study? Who did you learn from? Where's your fit from? Fit is understanding. If you have no fit, then shut up. Wallahi, if you have no fit, then shut up. Because Wallahi, the sukut is salama. Imam Malik radiallahu anhu yaqulu, إذا كنتم جليس قاما فكن أسكتهم فإن أصابوا كنت من ضمنهم وإن أخطأوا سلمت من خطائهم If you're sitting with the people, be the most silent of them Because if they are sound in what they're saying, you're from amongst them, you get that reward And if they make mistakes, then you don't share in the mistakes they make We have to learn our own place We have to know who we are There is no, uh, this opinion, everybody has an opinion in Islam there's called Ahl al-Ahl al-Ahl al-Ra'i wal aqad People of opinion are people who have, a, have learned and mastered their nafs and mastered certain sciences before they can start presenting opinions and things like this. And we have to recognize that. Go out and struggle. If you want to have an opinion, then I warn you about that. The Prophet ﷺ said at the end of time that there would be people اعجابوا كل ذي رأيين برأيه that this would be the age everybody impressed with their opinions. So I just, wallahi, uh, being here and seeing the situation of many of the, it, it, it's, it's tragic. If, if in, in a previous times, the only thing I can say, if, if, if a handful of tabi'een came to this country with the same opportunity, speak with the same freedom. The only thing the Prophet ﷺ wanted in Mecca was the opportunity to speak to people without obstruction. This is the only thing that he wanted. And all of us have this opportunity in these countries. We have the abilities to speak with to people without obstruction. And despite that, we are our own obstruction. We are the greatest barrier between Islam coming to these people. And excuse me if I said anything that uh, my intention was not to offend anybody. Which is